Thank you. This is the first time I've been to uh, an EAT forum, and thank you very much to Gunhild for inviting me. As Femi said, I have been uh, uh, really impressed by the enthusiasm and excitement here. Um, I'm also struck by the change in our attitude towards food policy over the last couple of decades. In 2000, I was uh, asked by the UK government to set up a new department, a non-ministerial department of which I was the head, to deal with national food policy. And I was told at the time my job was to ensure that the population of the United Kingdom had access to safe and nutritious food you'll notice what's missing there. There was no mention whatsoever of sustainability or impact on the environment. So the whole agenda that we're uh, uh, talking about and engaging with in these two days, at least in the United Kingdom, simply didn't exist in, in 2000. Um, there is one slight error that I made here. When um, Gunhild sent me an email saying, would I give a talk, and it said seven minutes, I assumed that was a misprint for 70 minutes. So I have prepared a 70-minute talk, and I hope you're all going to hunker down and stay with me for the course. Um, uh, on the other hand, Femi did warn me with uh, great severity that if I didn't finish in seven minutes, she'd come and uh, drag me out by the scruff of my neck. Um, so what I'm going to do, I hope in seven minutes, is to uh, tell you about some uh, current work that the Wellcome Trust is supporting uh, under this uh, headline of Our Planet, Our Health. I don't actually work for the Wellcome Trust, but they've uh, asked me to act as a consultant to them in relation to this particular program. Uh, for your background, and some of you will be familiar with this already, the Wellcome Trust is the world's second largest biomedical charity. It has an endowment of over £20 billion, and its traditional area of um, activity is to invest in research in basic biomedical sciences. But a few years ago, the Trust took the decision to step out of its comfort zone to address a much more complicated and challenging problem, the link between the health of the planet and the health of the human population. So the vision of this um, program that the Wellcome Trust is, is supporting over a period, will, uh, will be over a period of many years, is very simple. And it's a vision that we've all heard about and talked about in the last uh, day and a half, which is the link between the health of the environment and the health of the human population. And the Trust considered this was too important a challenge for it to ignore. And that's why they made the decision to invest in this area. And I was asked to uh, set up and chair an advisory board. And I just want to mention two people who are in the room who've worked very closely with me in this. One is Claire Matteson, uh, and the other is, is Dave Tillman. Both sit on the advisory board with me. So within this broad uh, framework of the link between plan uh, planetary health, environmental health, and human health, uh, the Wellcome Trust has identified three core pillars of research area, uh, which are, um, well, again, we've heard about all of these, uh, urbanization, the rapidly growing urban population in the world, and we heard some of the figures this morning, that's one area. The second is the relationship between diet and health and the environment. And the third is the impact of climate change on human health, whether it's through overheating, whether it's through spread of new diseases and other, other mechanisms. And of course, these three pillars of planetary health are all interlinked. The Wellcome Trust has decided to invest £75 million over the first few years in this research program. So it's quite a reasonable amount of money, but that's only the start, and the intention is for the program to develop and to increase in scale over the years ahead. The Wellcome Trust is interested in more than just new research. Uh, their goals are partly to build new interdisciplinary research partnerships to tackle these important challenges that we've been talking about, but also to go beyond that to uh, broker knowledge. We've heard already uh, uh, today part of the problem in terms of policy implementation is the gap between the knowledge that the scientists are beginning to accrue and the uh, impact of that knowledge in policymakers, in investors, uh, and in business. And finally, the trust wants to bring about change. 
There wouldn't be any point in embarking on this new program of work if it were not aimed at ultimately changing things for the better. So far, so what has the Trust done? So far, the Trust has um, funded four major research partnerships in this program. Uh, two of them are concerned with urbanization, one in Latin America and one in uh, Southeast Asia, based out of Monash University in Australia. So the program is global. And then two concerned with diet and health and the environment, one based in Oxford uh, and one based at the London School of uh, Tropical Hygiene. And as I say, that's just the beginning of uh, the Wellcome Trust investment. They will be continuing to invest over the years ahead. I'm going to say a little bit about these two food-related programs. Obviously, they're just at a start, so I can't tell you what they're fi going to find out, but I can tell you some of the questions they're trying to answer. So the, the one that uh, is based in Oxford is being run by Charles Godfrey and Susan Jebb. And it involves a number of partners, including, as was mentioned by Jeremy Collar this morning, uh, the, one of the major food re retailers in the United Kingdom, Sainsbury's. And what's this program, uh, research program aimed at doing? It's aimed at trying to understand, again, something that we've talked about a lot, what are the alternatives to animal sourced protein that could provide uh, a nutritious and environmentally friendly diet and how might behavior change towards a different diet be achieved? So the work is going to partly uh, involve uh, prospective analysis of, uh, or analysis of prospective cohort studies, and there are a number of very large databases which are uh, um, based in the United Kingdom and elsewhere, but have centers of analysis in Oxford. There's the Million Women Study, there's the European Prospective Study uh, on Cancer and uh, Health, the EPIC Study, and there's the UK Biobank Study. So this is a very rich source of data for doing prospective epidemiological research on the implications of different components of animal protein in the diet and their implications for chronic disease. Um, they're, they're going to do reviews of the literature, and importantly, and this is where the link with Sainsbury's comes in, they're going to do experimental work in supermarkets to try and understand how consumer behavior can be affected by the presentation of food in the supermarket setting. So it's, it's going to address what I think is one of the key challenges in this whole area, which is behavior change. And we heard a very interesting presentation earlier on today uh, about uh, behavior change and drawing the analogy between uh, changes in behavior of drivers and possibly changes in behavior of, of consumers of food. But uh, it, I, to me, it's one of the most difficult areas for us to tackle. Uh, the other project that's been uh, funded in this area is uh, at the London School, uh, led by Alan Dangor, and uh, he wants, and he and his team, it's a large team, are going to analyse the two-way interactions between food production systems, food consumption, and human health. So these are all interrelated with one another, and they're focusing in two parts of the world. In um, The top two slides are in India, and the bottom two slides in South Africa. And we've heard in the last day and a half presentations about the rapidly changing food system in India with the increase in consumption of processed food. And we heard yesterday about production of food in the urban setting in Cape Town in South Africa. So these are places where um, the time is up, so I'm going to stop places where um, food production systems are changing and uh, the impacts of people's diets as they change on the environment, whether it's to do with greenhouse gases or water supply, will also be important. On my final slide, I just want to turn to the question of how we go from knowledge uh, through to action and change. And one of the things that struck me in the last uh, day and a half is the very large numbers of uh, groups of people who are enthusiastic about synthesizing knowledge and trying to formulate it into uh, policy-relevant summaries. 
uh, whether it's the work that Jeremy Oppenheim's doing, whether it's the Lancet Commission, uh, whether it's the work that Bob Watson talked about yesterday. And I think the Wellcome Trust, to end with a question, is interested in uh, finding out how it can contribute, both financially and through its convening power, to this large amount of work, and here are some of the bodies doing it, that are trying to bring about change, which to me is the real challenge for the future. Once we've talked about it, once we've begun to understand the problems, how can we turn that into action and eventually into change? Thank you very much.